Good morning, friends, and welcome to another Physically Distant Service. As we do each week, we record on Wednesday. And this particular Wednesday is a very monumental day in the life of our country. And I've so appreciated the 24-hour vigil for peace that we've had in the last 24 hours. We did a vigil by Zoom yesterday and then also in our courtyard together around a fire. And folks have been praying throughout this 24 hours. So I'm, I'm appreciative to join together in our community as we pray for peace during this time of transition. We do have a few announcements. As we do each week, we will have Zoom fellowship at 11 o'clock, and we encourage everyone to join us. You would have received the link for this during the week. And mark on your calendar February 7th for a Super Bowl tailgate party that's going to happen in our parking lot. It'll be from 3 to 5 that day, and there'll be games, and, and folks will be bringing food, and there'll be prizes. So uh, put that down for a physically distanced gathering that we can see each other in our parking lot on February 7th. Our adult Quaker affirmation program is coming. We're working on revisions to this. So stay tuned in the next couple months of when that program will start. Join me in prayer as we begin our service together. A prayer for truly living by Joyce Rupp. God, we move so fast and sometimes we see so little in our daily travails. Slow us down. Create in us a desire to pause. Help us to pursue moments of contemplation. Help us to see in a deeper way, to become more aware of what speaks to us in beauty and truth. Our inner eye gets misty, clouded over, dulled. We need to see in a new way, to dust off our heart, to perceive what is truly of value, and to find the deeper meaning in our lives. All of our ordinary moments are means of entering into a more significant relationship with you, God. In the midst of those very common happenings, you are ready to speak your word of love to us, if only we will recognize your presence. Teach us how to enjoy being. Encourage us to be present to the gifts that are ours. May we be more fully aware of what we see, taste, touch, hear, and smell. May this awareness of our senses sharpen our perception of our everyday treasures and lead us to greater joy and gratitude. Grant us the courage to be our true selves. Help us to let go of being overly concerned about what others think of us or how successful we are. May our inner freedom be strengthened and our delight in life be activated. Life is meant to be celebrated, enjoyed, delighted in, and embraced in all of its mystery. Guide us to our inner child. Draw us to your playground of creation, God of life, so that we will live more fully. Amen. Shall 
from the fear of humility. Deliver me, O God. Deliver me, O God. And I shall not want, no, I shall. Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Timothy 6, 6-19 in the Message Version. A devout life does bring wealth, but it's the rich simplicity of being yourself before God. Since we entered the world penniless and will leave it penniless, if we have bread on the table and shoes on our feet, that's enough. But if it's only money these leaders are after, they'll self-destruct in no time. Lust for money brings trouble, and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely and live to regret it bitterly ever after. But you, Timothy, man of God, run for your life from all this. Pursue a righteous life, a life of wonder, faith, love, steadiness, courtesy. Run hard and fast in the faith. Seize the eternal life, the life you were called to, the life you so fervently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. I'm charging you before the life-giving God and before Christ, who took his stand before Pontius Pilate and didn't give an inch. Keep this command of the letter and don't slack off. Our master Jesus Christ is on his way. He'll show up right on time his arrival guaranteed by the blessed and undisputed ruler, high king, high God. He's the only one death can't touch. His light so bright, no one can get close. He's never been seen by human eyes. Human eyes can't take him in. Honor to him and eternal rule, oh yes. Tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God, who piles on all the riches we could ever manage, to do good, to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. There's bound to come some trouble to your life That ain't nothing to be afraid of Oh, there's bound to come some trouble to your life That ain't no reason to fear I know there's bound to come some trouble to your life Reach out to Jesus and hold on tight he's been there before and he knows what it's like you'll find he's there there's bound to come some tears up in your eyes well that ain't nothing to be ashamed of i know there's bound to come 
calm some tears up in your eyes that ain't no reason to fear I know there's bound to come some tears up in your eyes reach out to Jesus and hold on tight he's been there before and he knows what it's like you'll find he's there now people say maybe your things will get better and people say maybe it won't be long and people say maybe you'll wake up tomorrow and it'll all be gone well i only know that maybe just ain't enough when you need There's only one thing that's clear there's bound to come some trouble to your life that ain't nothing to be afraid of I know there's bound to come some tears up in your eyes that ain't no reason to fear oh there's bound to come some trouble to your life Reach out to Jesus and hold on tight. He's been there before and he knows what it's like. You'll find he's there. Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you in the comfort of your own homes. Remember, we are recording this meeting for worship on a historic day. We do not know yet all that will transpire in the coming days. I've been blessed by those who have joined us in praying for peace in our country throughout this week. Thank you. Now, with all that's happened in our nation and world the last few weeks, and as we have begun another new year and another new administration, I continue to find myself pondering some difficult queries. Much of what has taken place has had me shaking my head and asking why, while also at times unable to articulate or vocalize my questions as the atrocities, the division, the vitriol, the white supremacy, and the blindness to see and respect one another in this nation and world continue to unfold. As I've tried hard to reflect and ponder all that is being presented to me each and every day, I resign myself to focus my reflection on three queries. What can I do? What can we do? And specifically, what can Quakers do? Maybe you have found yourself during this pandemic sitting on your couch, staring out your window, asking those same queries. Sadly, I'm beginning to realize that people throughout our nation and even around the world are asking these same questions. The struggles and unrest we've experienced are universal and have a global impact that affects our planet as a whole. This is why every January I find myself returning to the wisdom of leadership and organi organizational expert Margaret Wheatley. I was introduced to her in my doctoral program and she continues to ask poignant questions for our condition. In the beginning of her book, Turning to One Another, which has shaped much of my thinking for the last decade and helped me expand my views outside my own boxes, she says the following. As I listen to many people in many countries, I'm convinced we are disturbed by similar things. I've listened carefully to many comments and included some of them here. Taken as a whole, they paint a picture of people everywhere troubled by these times questioning what the future holds. Here are some of the comments and feelings I've heard expressed. See if what Margaret Wheatley has heard resonates with your own feelings deep down. Problems keep getting bigger. They're never solved. We solve one and it only creates more. I never learn why something happened. Maybe nobody knows. Maybe it's a conspiracy to keep us from knowing. There's more violence now and it's affecting people I love. 
Who can I believe? Who will tell me what's really going on? Things are out of control and only getting worse. I have no time for my family anymore. I'm living a life I don't like. I worry about my children. What will the world be like for them? Confronted with so much uncertainty and irrationality, how can we feel hopeful about the future? And this degree of uncertainty is affecting us personally. It's changing how we act and feel. I notice in myself and others, we're more cynical, impatient, fearful, angry, defensive, anxious, more likely to hurt those we love. Well, if this is true and resonates with how the world is feeling currently, our scripture text may get down to the fundamentals of how to begin making a positive shift, something I want us to consider as we continue on in 2021. In our scripture text that Beth read, we find Paul writing to Timothy to advise and counsel him on ministry. Right alongside Margaret Wheatley's turning to one another, I also return to these words from Paul each January as I prepare for a new year. As you may already know, Paul's epistles were written to churches in specific locations, thus the names Corinthians and Ephesians and Philippians, etc. But 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon were all written to individuals. In this first letter to Timothy, Paul focuses attention on several main subjects, law, prayer, bishops and deacons, advice to young pastors, and finally, a word to us all on faithful living. Please note, I sense Paul was often more radical than we allow him to be, and too often his writings have been more studied, debated, and even followed than the actual life and ministry of Jesus. Yet I think for this morning, we need to take a look at what Paul is presenting us from three different vantage points. One, what is Paul telling Timothy about how he should live? Two, what is Paul telling Timothy about God and Jesus? And three, what are we to glean from this last part of Paul's letter for our questioning condition? Before we break this down, I want to share something with you that may help put this into perspective. Just before we left Oregon, Sue and I had the opportunity to hear author and speaker Brian McLaren at Trinity Cathedral in Portland. We have had the opportunity to hear Brian on many occasions, but on this occasion he was speaking about his book, The Great Spiritual Migration, a book I've quoted often in my time here at First Friends. In one part of his talk, he shared the following. He said, Founders are typically generous, visionary, bold, and creative. But the religions that ostensibly carry on their work often become the opposite, constricted, change-averse, nostalgic, fearful, obsessed with boundary maintenance, turf battles, and money. Instead of greeting the world with open arms as their founders did, their successors stand guard with clenched fists. Instead of empowering others as their founder did, they hoard power. Instead of defying tradition and unleashing moral imagination as their founders did, they impose tradition and refuse to think outside the lines. A religion that cuts itself off from the example of its founder while still bearing the founder's name often becomes little more than a chaplaincy for other ideologies offering its services to the highest bidder. No wonder so many religious folks today wear down, burn out, and opt out. As I read again those words from Brian this week, I was immediately taken to our text for this morning. Much like Jesus and the disciples, Paul also considered a founder of the Christian faith, was bestowing on his apprentice Timothy the fundamentals of pastoral ministry. But even more, a warning on how one is to live the faithful life with integrity and impact. Paul told Timothy this, Remember to be yourself, who God created you to be. A universal struggle for people throughout the world. Too often we want to be anyone but ourselves. And when we are not living our life out of the imago Dei or the image of God within us, we live a life that creates anything but what Paul describes as a righteous life. Instead, we too often become what Brian describes, 
constricted, change averse, nostalgic, fearful, obsessed with boundary maintenance, turf battles, and yes, money. Paul warned Timothy and all of us who claim to follow Christ to heed his warning. Oh, lust for money brings trouble and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely and live to regret it bitterly ever after. Money, as well as its partners, power and control, are far from the life that Jesus modeled. And Paul wants Timothy to know that going down that path leads to destruction. Instead, Paul encourages Timothy to run for your life from all of this. This is coming from a man who is a living example of this very phrase. Paul himself had to turn from the money, the power, the control, the manipulation and law-oriented nature of being a leader in the Sanhedrin. Paul understood the sacrificial nature of becoming a leader in the birthing church. And his example was Jesus Christ himself. And so he gives a charge to Timothy, verses 13 through 16. I'm charging you before the life-giving God and before Christ who took his stand before Pontius Pilate and didn't give an inch. Keep this command to the letter and don't slack off. Our master Jesus Christ is on his way. He'll show up right on time. His arrival guaranteed by the blessed and undisputed ruler, high king, high God, He's the only one death can't touch. His light so bright, no one can get close. He's never been seen by human eyes. Human eyes can't take him in. Honor to him and eternal rule. Oh yes, only a man who has stood his ground on what he believes. A man who embraced the wonder was faithful, who loved, who loved beyond explanation, who set a steady course and didn't, did it all with honor and courtesy. This was a righteous and holy man. This was Jesus, folks. And what Paul is saying is that when we live like Jesus, what Paul calls the eternal life, it brings the eternal into now. Paul's warning seems rather simple. Don't be full of yourself. Don't be obsessed with money or fill in the blank with whatever it is, power or whatever. Rather, be like Jesus, live with wonder and faith and love and steadiness and courtesy. And as Paul finishes his first letter to Timothy, he says, tell them to go after God who piles on all the riches we could ever manage, to do good, to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. Margaret Wheatley, who I spoke of earlier in my sermon, realized that life comes from us making a change in how we act and feel and how we respond to those around us. After she asked, what can we do now to restore hope to the future? She said this, I found that I can only change how I act if I stay aware of my beliefs and my assumptions. Thoughts always reveal themselves in behavior. As humans, we often contradict ourselves. We say one thing, and then we do another. We state who we are, but then act contrary to that. We say we're open-minded, but then judge someone for their appearance. We say we're a team, but then gossip about a colleague. If we want to change our behavior, we need to notice our actions and see if we can uncover the belief that led to that response. I think as Quakers in our world today, we need to get honest and ask ourselves some tough queries. Are we contradicting ourselves? Do we act contrary to that in which we are called by God? Are we truly being ourselves? Are we trying to do good? Are we being rich in helping others? Are we extravagantly generous? These are the queries I want us to ponder as we continue on into 2021. Just maybe, if we were doing those things well, we would not have so much worry and fear in our lives. Maybe those problems and all that unrest would seem, wouldn't seem so disturbing. Maybe there would be less violence and more love, and people would be valued above the color of their skin, their political power, 
or marketable influence in our world. Maybe there would be less conspiracy and more trust among us. And just maybe we would find more time for what really matters. Our family, friends, and community. Or better yet, as Paul, through the eyes of Eugene Peterson, put it, just maybe we will gain a life that is truly life. As we now enter waiting worship, I ask you to ponder the queries I just shared in a manner of expectant waiting.
Friends, join me in our benediction today, a blessing by John O'Donohue. On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue, come to waken you in a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays in the curac of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. Have a great week, friends.